Longtime fans of the new oil may have noticed that I have been translating the website into video content. That's how I've started the channel off because I have this really weird hang up where I feel weird if I just start in the middle and go. So that's kind of been a good starting point for me. Anyways, that's just a thing for me. The point is that if I kept that trend going, this video should have been a Mac and Windows hardening guide, but I didn't want to do that. Truth is there's a lot of really good guides out there already. If you want me to do a hardening guide, go ahead and let me know in the comments. But in this video, I thought it might be more fun to do a Linux for beginners introduction. So in this video, let's talk about Linux. What is it? Why should you use it? And how can you get started? This video is brought to you by Session. Session is an end-to-end -end encrypted messenger that is available on all platforms. So that means Mac, Windows, Linux, Android, and iOS. Session is decentralized. It uses an onion routing system, kind of like Tor, and nodes are hosted by volunteers all over the world. Because of the onion routing, they are able to strip away tons of metadata and make the service almost completely anonymous. To further the aim of anonymity, Session does not require any personal information to set up. In fact, it doesn't even give you the option. There's no optional email or phone number, only display names. And to make things even better, at the time of this recording, Session has just added voice and video calls in a public beta. Now, like I said, that's a beta, so it may be a little bit buggy, but so far I've been hearing a lot of really good things. I plan to test it myself here pretty soon, and I am super excited for that. So if you're still on the hunt for an encrypted messenger that's right for you, go ahead and check out Session. It may be what you're looking for. And if you're one of those people who checked it out like a year, two, three years ago when it first came out, out, go ahead and give it another shot because they've really grown a lot. As with any service, they may not be right for everybody, but it doesn't hurt to check it out. Before we jump into the video, I have a note to some of the more experienced viewers in the audience. Some of the information in this video might be technically incorrect. For example, in the next section, I'm about to refer to Linux as an operating system, and I know it's technically a kernel. Please remember that this video is aimed at beginners. I am not trying to overwhelm them and make them experts who can compile their own Linux kernel from scratch. I want to show them that Linux is approachable, that it is accessible, and to give them the basic foundation to get started exploring it. So, as always, if I get anything really, really wrong that, like, jeopardizes somebody's security or might cause them to mess up their system, by all means, please let me know. But when it comes to some of the less important stuff, please be forgiving and patient with the inaccuracies. Remember, I'm trying to get more people using Linux, which is a win for all of us. It's okay for them to join the Linux community and then find out after the fact that Linux is technically a kernel. With that out of the way, let's talk about what is Linux. Well, like I said, Linux is basically an operating system like Windows or Mac OS. However, unlike Windows and Mac, Linux is open source. This has a lot of advantages like customization and the ability for people to audit it and look for vulnerabilities before the bad guys find them. We will talk about all of that in a little bit. Linux is wildly popular. And even if you think you've never used it, you actually probably have. In fact, if you're watching this video, I can almost guarantee that you're using Linux to watch it because Linux is really popular on servers. My PeerTube instance is run on Linux. YouTube and Odyssey are both also most likely run on Linux servers. Most websites you visit are hosted on Linux servers. Same thing with databases, so websites you sign into and use like that. In fact, in 2019, it's estimated that over 70% of servers out there were using Linux. But it's not just servers giving you the content, it's your devices too. Have you ever used an Android? That's based on the Linux kernel. Have you ever used Chrome OS? Also based on the Linux kernel. Linux is everywhere, and you've probably used it at some point in your life without even realizing it. Now, just to be clear, in this video, I'm going to be focusing on Linux desktop, which is the one that you run on desktops and laptops. So I'm not going to be talking about Android ROMs or Internet of Things or DDWRT or anything like that. We'll probably get to all of those in other videos. But for now, we're going to talk about desktop. With that said, why should you use Linux? The main reason is better privacy. Windows, for example, calls home to Microsoft over 5,000 times a day. Calling home, in case you're not aware of the terminology, that basically just means it contacts Microsoft for various reasons. Sometimes this is to check for updates or check to make sure your license is valid. But more often than not, this is just to let Microsoft know, hey, this person opened Word, this person opened the start menu, this person opened the calculator. Some people argue that Linux also offers better security. For some distributions, this is true. Generally speaking, most people seem to think this because of a concept called security through obscurity, which is the idea that you're hiding something and therefore no one will find it and that makes it secure. The reason this applies to Linux is because so few people use Linux, so there's less likely to be malware. 
However, that's not a guarantee. Linux malware is definitely a thing. We talk about it pretty regularly on Surveillance Report. There's also the argument that because Linux is open source, there's more people looking at the source code and finding vulnerabilities. With Mac and Windows, you usually, but not always, find them after the fact, after somebody has broken something and either is a good person who reported it or is a bad person who uses that to spread malware and do other malicious things. The open source nature of Linux does definitely allow for this, but again, it's not a hard and fast guarantee. There have been numerous examples of Linux and other open source programs having vulnerabilities that hid for years and just went undetected. Reading programming is not exactly like reading a book, so it's not always easy to spot this stuff. If you are interested in learning how to harden Linux, which means how to improve the security, I will leave a link to TechLore's video about this topic. I think it's pretty good. Last but not least, Linux is more customizable. This one's kind of a more ethical, philosophical point, but if you're a person who's really big on freedom and being in control of the devices that you own and not having a company tell you what you are and are not allowed to do with your devices, Linux fits your code of ethics pretty well. Again, it is designed to be customized and adjusted and changed. Let's talk about that real quick because there are different types of Linux. These are known as distributions or distros. Because Linux is open source, people are allowed to take the code and modify it and do whatever they want with it, which means that there are different distributions that focus on different things. Some of the distros focus on user friendliness. Some of them want to look like Mac. Some of them want to look like Windows. Some of them want to be more secure. Some of them are designed to be very lightweight. Some of them are designed to be anonymous and not leave any traces behind. There's even a version of Linux that is designed specifically for audio video professionals. I found that back when I was a freelancer. Unfortunately, I was never able to use it in a real world setting. I don't know how good it is, but seriously, that's how many versions of Linux there are. Now, generally speaking, most of these distros are forks of other distros, which means if you follow the ladder down, eventually you get to a certain number of basic root distros that everything else is based on. For desktop, this is mainly Debian, Red Hat, Arch, and Gentoo. So which distros do I recommend? Well, if you are a beginner approaching Linux for the very first time, I recommend Debian-based distros. So this would be things like Pop, Ubuntu, Mint, or Debian. In my opinion, these are the ones that are the most user-friendly and have the most support. By support, I mean help from the community, but I also mean the apps that work natively. Take, for example, Signal. Signal has instructions on how to add it directly into Debian-based distros. With all other distros, you have to find an alternative method, which I will talk about in a little bit. This is pretty common for a lot of other programs too, like Discord and Spotify. Most of them do have ways of working with multiple distros, but a lot of them seem to be ready to go for Debian. So again, if you're approaching Linux for the first time, I think you're gonna find the transition easiest if you start with Debian. You can always move on to something else later if you prefer. Okay, so you've come this far and you're like, this Linux thing is really interesting and I wanna try it out. How do I get started? Well, the exact steps vary from distro to distro, but generally speaking, they all follow the same pattern. You pick your distro, you go to their website, you download the file, you flash it to a USB stick, and then you boot from the USB stick and follow the instructions. Most distros offer very detailed instructions on how to do this process. Some of them may even offer screenshots. Some of them, like Mint, for example, actually allow you to run it off the USB stick so you can try it for a little while and look around and see if it's right for you before installing it onto your computer. At some point, I will make a video about virtual machines and how you can test out a whole bunch of Linux distros at once, but I'm not sure when I'm gonna do that. Don't worry, I haven't forgotten about those. If you are still confused by this description, I'm going to leave a video in the show notes by Mental Outlaw. He recently did a video about how to install Linux Mint on an old laptop, and it's a fantastic video. He goes through start to finish from downloading it from the website, putting it on the USB stick, and he has an actual camera set up on the computer so you can see what he's doing the whole time, not just the screen. It's really good. I'll leave that in the show notes. Okay, so once you've got Linux up and running, chances are it's not going to have all of the programs that you want. For example, most Linux distros come with Firefox, and maybe you're more of a brave person. Once you're ready to start adding your software, there are a few different options. The first and easiest option is if you are using one of the beginner distros that I recommended, most of them will come with a software store. You can easily use this to look up any piece of software, and if it's in there, just click and install. It's just like the App Store on Mac or the Play Store on Android. If something is not in the software store, then you have three options. The first option is to add it from the repositories. This is my personal favorite because then when you update the system, the programs will update along with it. I'll talk about that in the next section. If something is not in the repositories or you are not comfortable using the command line, your second choice is to find a .deb file. 
If you're using a non-Debian based distro, this might be something else like .rpm is for Fedora, for example. Think of these kind of like the executables that you use to use on Windows or the .dmgs on Mac. You may have to use the command line, but even if you do, it's very simple. It's like one command. If that is not an option for you, then the next choice would be app images, snaps, and flat packs. Now, these all fall under the same umbrella, but they work a little bit differently. All of these are basically designed to be standalone programs that have everything you need in the file to run. They don't install like a .deb does, for example, but they function similar to the shortcuts on your desktop. You just double click it and it opens and you're ready to run the program. And when you're done, you just close it. Dead simple. I personally prefer app images. In my opinion, they are the most common. They can be downloaded directly from the service and they're just ready to go. They tend to be faster and smaller in file size than the other two options. Now, the other two options, snaps and flat packs, these function basically the same. There is a store that you download them from, kind of like the software store, and then you run them. Snaps can be gotten from the Snap Store, which is run by Canonical, which is the company behind Ubuntu, whereas flat packs are decentralized. So there's a lot of different stores. Flat Hub is the most common. I would start there if you are interested in flat packs. Flat packs are considered significantly more secure, but they have bigger file sizes and tend to run a little bit slower. Snaps fall somewhere in the middle. Okay, so what if there's a specific niche piece of software that you want to use, like Pro Tools or Photoshop or something like that? Well, in this case, you have two options. Your first choice is to find an alternative. For example, instead of using Microsoft Office, you could use LibreOffice. Now, this is actually a really good comparison because in this case, LibreOffice is not quite as pretty and polished as Microsoft Office. And generally speaking, that's going to be pretty true across the open source world. Whenever you find an alternative piece of software that is Linux compatible, especially if it's open source, truthfully, it usually doesn't look as pretty as the big tech version. However, it's going to offer you a lot more privacy. LibreOffice does not alert the LibreOffice Foundation every time you open their program. If you are looking for a specific program and you've checked out the alternatives and they just won't work, that program has a very specific feature you need, I would recommend checking out Wine. Wine is an application layer. I tell people to think of it kind of like an emulator. That's not what it is, but it works in a similar way. Once you install Wine, it allows certain Windows programs to run on Linux. Now, again, it doesn't get all programs, but it does get a pretty good number of them. So if you absolutely have to have a program on Linux, be sure to look into that. Okay, so now that you've got all these programs, you're going to have to keep them up to date and the system itself. Updates are really, really important for security. So how do you update Linux? Again, if you have a software store, that's probably going to be the easiest option. Usually Linux has an icon somewhere or some kind of pop-up, depending on the distro, that will tell you that things are ready for updates. This is true for snaps and flat packs as well. You can just go to the store and update. App images and executables like .debs kind of vary. Some of them will tell you that there's an update available. Some of them will even offer to download it for you. Some of them won't. So you'll kind of have to figure out which ones will let you know and which ones you have to stay on top of. Finally, you can always use the command line, which is my favorite because it makes me feel really cool. And it also tells me if something doesn't update and why. For Debian based distros, the update command is sudo apt update and and sudo apt upgrade y. Now, a quick note here, you don't have to learn how to use the terminal. However, I strongly recommend that you do get at least a little bit of a passing knowledge with it. Look, I'm not a Linux expert. I am not a master of the terminal. I know how to update things, how to check which disks are currently plugged in like USB sticks and stuff and how to install DEB files. That's pretty much it. I think there's a fourth one I'm forgetting, but seriously, I only know like four or five commands off the top of my head. You don't have to be an expert to use the command line, but there's a reason I think you should get comfortable with it. And that leads us into our next section, which is what if you run into problems? Truthfully, you're probably going to run into problems, especially if you make Linux your main operating system. This is called a daily driver, by the way. Well, if you do run into any issues, this is why I recommend starting on a Debian based distro, because the first solution I would recommend is to search it. Go to your favorite privacy respecting search engine and look up either the error that you're getting or the problem that you're having. With these really, really popular distros like Ubuntu and Mint, you are probably not the first person to have that issue. More often than not, just searching the issue will bring up a solution. More often than not, though, that solution may involve using the terminal. So that's why I think you should kind of get a little bit comfortable with it. If searching it doesn't turn up any results or you don't understand the solutions offered, I recommend forums like Reddit or Matrix. In my experience, there are tons of nice people out there who are super excited that you are getting interested in Linux and want to help you. Just be kind. 
Remember, these people are taking time out of their days to help you with your problem. They could be doing a million other things. So be friendly, be polite, thank them for their help. And just a quick little pro tip, I've had a lot of success by saying that I am not a Linux expert. A lot of the time when I post for help, I explicitly say, hey, I'm willing to post any error logs or any kind of troubleshooting you need me to do, but I'm not really an expert, so you might have to tell me how to run the command or where to find those logs. Nine out of 10 times, people will respect that. They'll let you know, hey, type this command in and let us know what pops out, or you can find your error logs here. What do those say? Most Linux people are happy that you are finally taking back your digital privacy and freedom, and they are more than willing to help you. If for some reason none of that works or you don't have a Reddit or a matrix or whatever, you could also reach out directly to the project. A lot of them have documentation on their website. In fact, that might be a good place to start before you go to Reddit or matrix. If they don't have documentation, they might have forums or chat rooms. These are all really good places to go get help. And that's really pretty much it. That should be everything you need to know about using Linux and how to get started with it. That should be enough to get you off the ground, at least long enough to explore Linux and see if it's right for you. Once again, this video was sponsored by Session, an end-to-end -end encrypted messenger that I am a huge fan of and have been for years. Session is decentralized. They have nodes all over the planet run entirely by volunteers and not by the team. Because they have nodes, they are also onion routed, which means that your messages bounce around from node to node, which helps to make them more anonymous and strip away metadata. And finally, Session does not ask for any personal information on signup. There's no email, there's no phone number. They don't verify your identity in any way. And they have just added voice and video calls in public beta. So Session is ready to be a daily messenger. It can send pictures, it can make phone calls, it can send messages, and it has been audited, by the way. I forgot to mention that in the promo spot up front, but yeah, they've been audited. So if you're concerned about Session security, go ahead and check that out. If you want to learn more about Linux, I don't really have a lot of pages on my website diving into it because I think Linux is a little bit more of an advanced topic. It's kind of a gray area, but I do have some resources on my website that will help you pick the right distro for you and help teach you some more basic stuff. So be sure to check that out at thenewoil.org.